told I was, went a little fast last time, so please stop me uh, often and slow me down. I'm also awake today, which should help. Um, so last time we talked about some general uh, formalism of what topological field theories are, uh, and we also discussed a couple of examples. Um, in the two examples, we said that if, we have, if you have C, uh, a, a DG category, uh, we can ask, for it to define a two-dimensional topological field theory, for it to be two-dualizable is a very strong condition, and it, it means that this category is, um, has this property of being smooth and proper. Uh, and we, we gave two examples of this, um, and the two examples are, maybe the most concrete example is, uh, maybe I'll call 2D Yang-Mills, but finite group Yang-Mills, we just start with a finite group and we take a category of representations of the group. Um, that's sort of the, the kind of most concrete example. Uh, and the, uh, the most well-known example, in some ways, is, is the B model, where we take x to be a smooth and proper variety. Um, and then we look at uh, the derived category, say, the, the big, where if we're working with big versions, we like quasi-coherent sheaves on x as our category, and this defines a two-dimensional topological field theory. Uh, if we drop smoothness or properness, uh, we don't get something two-dimensional, we still get something one-dimensional, it still gets something one-dualizable. Similarly, if we drop the group being finite, we still get invariants for one manifold, but we don't get numbers for two manifolds. Um, and that's going to be a much more typical situation than what we'll see today. When you go beyond two dimensions, except for examples basically built out of finite groups, it's, uh, over C, I don't know any examples of things that are really full dual, fully dualizable, things that make it all the way up to numbers. And so um, we're not going to make it up to numbers at, in the end, but we're going to be able to construct a lot of examples of things that make it almost there. So, um, so here's a main class of examples I, I want to start with. Um, is stay, Suppose we take any commutative ring or commutative ring, well, by, by ring I mean commutative differential graded algebra, and again, everything I'm, I'm talking about is going to, I'm only going to work over C. Uh, any commutative ring R is n plus one dualizable uh, for any n. So what does that, what do I mean by n plus one dualizable for any n? I'm going to, I can think of a commutative ring, can, I can consider, I can consider the ring R as an n category, n category for any n. And what this claim is that this n category is going to be n dualizable, which is not as much as you might have hoped for. Uh, if n categories, the collection of n categories forms an n plus one category, so you might have hoped for something to be n plus one dualizable, but uh, it doesn't make it this way. And so what is, what is this construction? What, how, how do you think of a commutative ring as an n category? You can think of it in this kind of very degenerate way as an n category with one object and one one morphism, one two morphism, one blah, 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 blah. Or you could just say, given a commutative ring, R, we can look at R mod. Look at the category of modules for R. Because R is commutative, this is still a symmetric monoidal category. And so it makes sense to talk about modules for R mod just module categories for this symmetric monoidal category. And then we can look, but because this is symmetric monoidal, R mod still has a commutative multiplication. So you can look at R mod mod, and so on, and just do it however many times you want. That's how you make an n category out of a commutative ring. Um, again, I would, might rather think of it as, a, as an n category that's generated by a single object and one, one, a single one morphism and so on, and a bunch of, of n morphisms. Okay, so this is uh, so now the claim is that this construction is dualizable for for any n. And now, what is the um, what is the construction? This is what is the field theory? This is something that already appeared in Bertrand's talks. Um, so so if m is a manifold, well, but in fact I don't need it to be a manifold for this construction. Suppose you take m to be a homotopy type. Just m uh, is just a is just a homotopy type. 
So this is not going to be sensitive to anything about the geometry of manifolds. Uh, Bertrand told us about taking derived mapping spaces. We can talk about spec r, spec r to the m. So this is the, or just the, the derived mapping space from the homotopy type m to the affine derived scheme spec r. Uh, and this is, again, some, some affine derived scheme um, over here, and, and we can look at functions. So, and we can look at functions on uh, this this ring, and, and look at functions on spec R to the M. So, this is a ring. You can just say this more directly in terms instead of instead of saying in mapping spaces. This is a construction you can directly say in terms of the ring. We take out the ring and we tensor it with M. So, there's an operation of taking commutative DGAs and tensoring them with simplicial sets or homotopy types. So given any homotopy type, or I'm going to think of that homotopy type concretely as a simplicial set, I can form this derived tensor product. And I mean, maybe you could, if you're already happy with this mapping space, you could just define it this way. Or you can just write it down concretely. Uh, it's just, an, you know, this, this derived mapping space is some, what is the derived mapping space? It's some kind of, here's my simplicial set and I'm trying to map it into spec R, this is some um, iterated fiber product, iterated drive fiber product. I have a bunch of points. So I have here three copies of spec R, and then I have a bunch of equations. So I'm taking a bunch of fiber products of those copies, and then I'm taking, imposing some more equations and some more equations and so on. Uh, and you can write the same thing on the level of the ring. You could say that um, you know, if I give you a simplicial set, I can take a copy of R at each vertex, and I can take a t relative tensor products. I'm going to take R tensor R with these modules. So here, I'm just going to identify these two R's. I can take a bunch of, so I put R's everywhere, and just take a, make a big tensor product. So I'll leave you to write this down more formally. And then you have an R in the middle that acts on everything in sight. And so you could just write down some big um, co-limit, some big uh, iterated tensor product. Um, and that's what, that's what this. Um, R tensor or simplicial set is. So, so the idea is that for any manifold M, we'll attach um, this, this, this ring, R tensor M. Well, how does that look like a field theory? If, again, this works for any simplicial set, but suppose this is a K manifold, then I'm going to, to think of this um, as, a, as a K category. I mean, this is a. Yeah, in a second. Yeah, yeah. Oh, not in a second. Um, so yeah. So, so the, the basic example of this is just that. Uh, so, if you take R tensor S one, then that just means. Uh, let me write the circle a little differently. I have R and R and R and R. So you get R tensor R as over R tensor R, which is exactly Hochschild homology. If, uh, we could call it topological if you were dealing with spectra rather than um, DGAs. Uh, so for, for, general set. for a general simplicial set, you have a general construction, which in the case of a circle is the Hochschild homology. And so it's a kind of higher, you can call it some kind of higher to Hochschild homology. Um, and, that's, and then that may, may be a good thing to think about what the whole cobordism hypothesis is. The invariants we attach to manifolds are some higher versions of Hochschild homologies. Um, so that's, so that's the, the example. And in this case, it's functions on spec R to the S1, which is, as Bertrand introduced, is the loop space, is this derived loop space of spec R. So functions on derived loop space are Hochschild homology. Um, so, and how do I think about this as a field theory? Well, again, all of these outputs, all of these tensor products are, again, commutative rings. Everything here inside is a commutative DGA. So again, I can think of it as a K category for any K I want. So if I'm trying to build a topological field theory, I want to attach to K manifolds K categories. Well, I've attached to a K manifold a commutative ring. Just think about this as a, as a K category. And the point is that this forms, this forms a topological field theory. So in other words, the integral over M of R is uh, M tensor R considered, if you like, considered as a K category where k is the dimension of m. And so this is a topological field theory. So for example, um, for example, if I'm trying to think of a, if, if m is a, a, the, a one manifold, like the circle, I'm thinking about modules. So um, yeah, so for, yeah. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Um, right, so if I have an n manifold, if I have an n manifold, I want to attach to it a vector space. I'm never getting numbers out of this construction. To an n minus one manifold, to an n manifold, I get a vector space. So n minus, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so that's so that's the construction. Now, um, all right. So what so what does this um, so this gives us a class of topological field theories. Um, which is uh, a kind of generalization of the of the B model. Uh, it's kind of a derived algebraic geometry produces a bunch of field theories this way. They never produce numbers, but they they're pretty. But they produce a lot of other interesting structures about, including structures about Hochschild homology. Uh, I, I, you can you can play variants with this game. Instead of instead of R a commutative ring, suppose C is a symmetric monoidal category. monoidal infinity, everything again is infinity category. So that's a commutative ring in the world of categories. I can do the exact same construction with that. So I can just r literally everywhere you see an R, put a C. And all the construction makes the same. So this is n, if you'd like, n plus 2 dualizable uh, for all n. So I'm going, uh, at the, since I'm starting with a symmetric monoidal category, I'm never going to get a vector space out of it. I'm only going to get things of the same kind. I'm going to get symmetric monoidal categories. So I can take for, um, for any simplicial set, I can define this m tensor c. Um, and and this, this will form a, a category, which, uh, which is, in fact, a symmetric monoidal category. And so I can boost it up and think of something higher. I'll never get a vector space. I'll certainly never get a number. So, um, so one. One, now here, uh, so here, here's for a class of examples. Suppose that if you have, if x is a is a stack, um, we can produce out of it uh, some a symmetric monoidal category, quasi-coherent sheaves on x. So instead of thinking of a ring as functions on spec R, we can consider more uh, categories which are quasi-coherent sheaves on x, which would be R mod uh, if x is spec R. So this is kind of a the, contains the previous examples. Um, so if we look at quasi-coherent sheaves on X, and we can ask um, what happens if I take, let's take this as our C, uh, and you can ask to compare quasi-coherent sheaves on X um, tensor M with quasi-coherent sheaves on the derived loop space. So we can again could take the co derived loop space of the, the derived mapping space. We can map from M into X. That's a derived stack. And we can ask for, um, for quasi-coherent sheaves on that. And the claim is that these two are equivalent if the stack is, is nice enough. This is not tautological, like in the commutative ring case. But it's true if the stack has some nice adjective. So we have this adjective we like to call perfect stack, so it's basically any, any scheme, so this is something, a, a big class, so this is, you know, e.g. any quasi-compact separated scheme, or any, any stack that you run into in characteristic zero, anything with affine diagonal, quasi-compact with affine diagonal. So basically, most common things we're going to run into um, are, are of this kind, and so we know what this field theory, what this field theory that we're trying to produce is doing, is that to any manifold M, we're looking at the mapping space, from x to m, and we're looking at sheaves on that. And that, that's what our field theory is producing. OK. Um, so maybe this is a, goes by the name of a fact in Bertrand's uh, terminology. Um, so OK, so, so this is, gives us a construction of field theories. Um, so what is it? What makes something, uh, maybe just to say a little, more technically, what does it mean to be to be perfect? Perfect is really a, a, a categorical. It's something about the category of quasi-coherent sheaves being nice. Um, so, so perfect. What we really want from perfect, uh, perfect. What it really tells you is that if you look at the quasi-coherent quasi sheaves um, on X, is uh, is compactly generated generated by by dualizable objects. Or more precisely, the, the compact objects are exactly the dualizable objects. Yeah. This is the definition. So, so, so Q, X, X is perfect 
if and only if uh, the compact objects um, in here are exactly the dualizables, uh, which end up being the perfect, complex, perfect complexes by Thomason. Uh, and and you, want, you want x to be such that this is compactly generated and that this is, uh, these are the compact objects. So this property of being compactly generated, this is a version of, of rigidity. Uh, in, this is something that you, some version of being the category being a rigid category. And this property enough in itself automatically um, guarantees that if I just think of this as a, as a category, so now I'm going to think of this, so I'm going to think of this as a monoidal category. So, so I'm thinking of this as, as a monoidal category, so a special kind of two category. This is automatically two plus one dualizable. So what does this mean? I can define a field theory. So I'm trying to define a three-dimensional field theory. So I'm not trying to do arbitrary n now. I'm trying to define a three-dimensional field theory that I'm going to make it to give, uh, cat to, to give all the way up to vector spaces, attach vector spaces to two manifold. And this field theory is uh, what I'd like to call uh, rosansky witten theory uh, in quotation marks. And I'll maybe explain the quotation marks later. Um, so this is rosansky witten theory. So what is this topological field theory that we're, that we're discussing? So what does it do? Uh, so by construction to a point, I'm attaching um, a two category, or if you like, just the monoidal category, which is QC of X with tensor product. So I'm thinking of this as a monoidal category, or if you prefer, you, you can think of attaching um, QC of X mod as a two category. So this is exactly, um, so this, by a theorem uh, of, of Dennis's, is the same as uh, quasi-coherent sheaves of categories, exactly in the sense that we had in the previous talks, of categories um, over x. Okay, so this is a, a version of one affineness. Yeah. Yeah, so here I have a symmetric monoidal, so yeah, it's an internal version. I have a symmetric monoidal category. I have an object of this symmetric monoidal category as to be, to be dualizable with respect to, to that symmetric monoidal structure. And I want the, the compact objects and the dualizable objects. You have different notions what you might mean by small, and you want the different notions to agree. Um, and thanks to Thomason, they, they agree basically all the time for, in com common examples. Um, okay, so, so what we attach to a point is this two category of sheaves of categories over X. Uh, or if you'd like, you could just think of attaching this, uh, symmetric, this monoidal category. What we attach to one manifold, so to a circle, say, uh, well, I told you, that you what to attach to a circle, we're just going to take quasi-coherent sheaves on the, on the loop space of X, which is quasi-coherent sheaves, uh, sorry, the Q Cohen, Seems to switch around. Anyway, so that's this Hochschild homology. That's a Hochschild homology of quasi-coherent sheaves on X. Um, so now it, we're not thinking of this as a monoidal category anymore, just as the plain category. To a circle, we're attaching a category, which is sheaves on the loop space. Um, and, to, um, and now the, the feature we have now is that this is too dualizable. I actually get to attach vector spaces to two manifolds. So that's the part that wasn't completely tautological from this tensor product assertion. I'm doing a little better than I might have automatically hoped to do. Um, and so to, to a surface, a topological surface, I'm attaching a vector space, which is just functions now on the derived mapping space. So I look at the, the derived mapping space from this simplicial set to x. So that's some derived scheme or derived stack if x was a stack. And I look at functions on this. And so, um, and, and moreover, I'm not, of course, I'm not giving you the whole field here, but again, there's the same kind of operations like we drew before. If you have a cobordism, uh, you have a cobordism, say, between sigma a and sigma out, then we look at um, x to the sigma, define the correspondence between x to the sigma in and x to the sigma out. And you, get an, and you get an operation from quasi-coherent sheaves here to quasi-coherent sheaves here, which is pull back and push forward. 
So here I have a one manifold, here I have another manifold, and I have an operation given by pull, pull, push pull for quasi coherent sheaves. And that's, uh, that's what this. So if these uh, boundaries are empty, you're just going to get the der derived functions on this derived scheme. OK. So that's, that's what the field theory is. And so let's give the, the, an example, the kind of example we're, uh, we're, caring, we're going to care most of, about. As in Bertrand's talk, let's take x to be bg. Uh, and g needs to be an affine. To be a perfect stack, I need affine diagonal. I, 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 but, so let's take an affine group scheme. Uh, so if, it, if x is bg, I can, I can, what, what do I get? So to a point, I get uh, quasi-coherent sheaves on bg, which is rep g. I get rep g module categories. So I take the symmetric monoidal category of representations of g, and I look at module categories for that, which again, by Dennis's theorem, is equivalent to quasi-coherent sheaves of categories on bg, which has a more familiar name. This is just algebraic algebraic G categories, algebraic actions of the group and categories, or by which maybe I'll define that as saying, look at sheaves on G with convolution. So here G is a group, so it has a ma map G cross G to G. You have a push forward for that, def that defines a convolution on sheaves. And you look at modules for this. So this is the kind of categorified group algebra. Look at modules for that. And uh, so that's what we're attaching to a point, to a point we're attaching the rep categorical representations of G in this algebraic sense. And to the circle, we're attaching uh, quasi-coherent sheaves on the loop space of BG, which is the adjoint quotient, G mod G. So it's kind of character or class sheaves instead of class functions, which is adjoint equivariant sheaves on, the, on G. And to a surface, we're attaching functions on BG to the sigma, which is local systems G on sigma. I'm using always the Betty sense of local systems. So this is um, the Betty space of local systems on the topological surface sigma. So we have functions on this derived scheme of local systems. So that's an example of this theory, of this, what I'm calling rosansky witten theory. Now, uh, maybe I should say, why is it why is it called rosansky witten theory, and why is it called rosansky witten theory in quotes? Um, and rosansky witten theory of what, also? Um, and so this is, if you look at rosansky witten theory, if you read the literature on rosansky witten theory, rosansky witten theory is, is, a, is a three-dymensional topological field theory attached to a holomorphic symplectic manifold. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it has a feature, it's attached, first of all, to a holomorphic symplectic manifold, and it also has the unfortunate feature of not uh, giving uh, z-graded vector spaces, as you might have hoped, but only z-mod two-graded vector spaces. So what, is, what does that have to do with this? So let's just assume, just for simplicity, that x is a scheme, or let's just say smooth scheme. I don't know if the smoothness is terribly important. Let's suppose x is a smooth scheme. So what, are we, so what I'm claiming is that this, what we're constructing, this rosansky witten theory above, is, is, is very close to what you might call the rosansky witten theory, without quotations, of the cotangent bundle of X. Now, what does it mean, rosansky witten what is the characteristic feature that you want to say it's rosansky witten theory of cotangent bundle of X? It's something that when you compactify on the circle, so it's supposed to be a 3D field theory, that when you compactify on the circle, you're supposed to get the B model the B model of T star X. Um, now, again, T star X is certainly not uh, proper. So when I say the B model, I'm not going to get invariance for two manifolds here. So I'm not going to get invariance for close three manifolds here. But I, so this, this just means the 2D field theory attached to the, the derived category of quasi-coherent sheaves on T star X. But here, I only get it two periodically. I only get, it, I only get this if, if I make this guy um, two periodic, so I tensor it, if you like, with polynomials on epsilon and epsilon inverse, where the degree of epsilon is two. So I'm getting a, a two periodic version of the B model. Uh, and so how does that have to do with what we're doing? If we look at uh, the relations given by causal duality. So if you look at, um, well, what is compactification on the circle? That just means we cross everything with a circle. So let's just look at what we attach to a circle. To a circle, we attach quasi-coherent sheaves on LX. Now, what does LX have to do with T star X? 
Uh, well, LX, uh, as, as it has been explained a couple times, is isomorphic to uh, the shift of the tangent bundle of X. Uh, so quasi-coherent sheaves on the shift of the tangent bundle of X are very close to being quasi-coherent sheaves on the cotangent bundle of X um, with, with another shift. Uh, but again, we've, we've, we should know better if you really try to compare, so, and this is, this is given by, by causal duality. So this is modules for some exterior algebra. This is modules for the exterior algebra on differential forms. And this is modules for a symmetric algebra on the tangent bundle with a shift. Um, hopefully I got my numbers right. Um, and, but, but really, this uh, causal duality does not replace quasi-coherent sheaves with quasi-coherent sheaves. Because, uh, the, for example, the symmetric algebra itself here, doesn't, which is a compact object here, doesn't go to a compact object here. The symmetric algebra here goes to the structure sheaf of X, of constant loops inside of loop space. So really what you need to do is to, this, what you get from here is not quasi-coherent sheaves on the cotangent bundle, but some completed version. So this guy is really a completed version of quasi-coherent sheaves on the cotangent bundle. It only sees quasi-coherent sheaves near the zero section on this cotangent bundle. Um, so what you really want to do is replace this with, uh, with INCO. So what you would really like is a version of Rylands Quinton theory. You don't want to get QC of a loop space. You want to get INCO of a loop space. And for that, you really need to change what you attach to a point. That's something that's being done, but uh, hasn't been done yet. Um, so, so, you're, you're, so here, what you're seeing is, a, a, is not the whole cotangent bundle, but just a little formal completion. And what is this nonsense about two periodicity? The point is that you really, in Roland's Quinton theory, you shouldn't have been thinking about a holomorphic symplectic manifold. You should have been thinking about a graded holomorphic symplectic manifold. That really, what you're getting is not the ordinary cotangent bundle, but the cotangent bundle with a shift. So if you want to ignore that distinction, you can work two periodically. Here, there was nothing two periodic. OK, so uh, we'll, we'll see this issue coming up again and again. Um, of this INCO versus uh, QCO, of course, as we've already seen in many other talks. Um, so that's why it's, I'm calling it rosansky witten theory in quotes. You really want to, it's some small version of rosansky witten theory. You want to, it's sort of a completed version, and you want to uncomplete it, replace QCO by INCO everywhere. OK, so that's, um, that's one class of example of topological field theory. And questions? OK, so. Um, there's a, a variant of this that I am fond of as um, another three-dimensional topological field theory, um, which called character theory. So this is another uh, three-dimensional topological field theory, um, which is very similar to what we had in the case of, so before we, in the case of rosansky witten theory um, on BG was, was uh, studying algebraic G categories, but the kind of G categories that appear in representation theory most are not usually just algebraic G categories, but they're strong or Durham G categories. So what you could do is, is, is replace this. So I'm going to take G to be reductive, and, um, and I'm going to study, instead of algebraic G categories, look at mo uh, module categories for D modules on, on G. Look at D modules on G rather than quasi-coherent sheaves on G uh, module categories. OK, so this is the same thing as, as sheaves of categories over BG Durham, but it's not the same as module categories for QC of BG Durham. This is not a one affine situation, so it's not quite as nice. Here, I'm not writing it as modules for symmetric monoidal category. I don't have the kind of dual version of rep G, which is a symmetric monoidal category. I'm writing it as modules for just a monoidal category. And so uh, I, a priori, I don't, um, I don't have any right to expect this thing to be 2 plus 1 dualizable like it was before. And in fact, it's not. This is only 1 plus 2 dualizable. In other words, it's trying to be a 3D field theory. It doesn't make it very far. Um, so we'll try to fix that. But let's just say. Um, so it's a, monoidal, it's a monoidal category, so it's kind of an algebra. We said algebras are always one-dualizable. This guy doesn't have a choice but to be one-dualizable. It doesn't do anything better than what it has no choice to do. 
Um, so but what does it attach? Well, we can still see what it attaches to a circle. I, I have to be a little careful about what circle I mean. I really mean the, the annulus. Uh, what it attaches to a circle is very much what you might expect, is class functions in the world of D modules instead of quasi-coherent sheaves. That's something that does make sense. And you kind of, want and you kind of know what it should attach to a surface. So I, I have an answer I can give for a surface, but uh, you know, to a question that doesn't make sense yet, because the theory is not too dualizable. But I have an expectation. So before I had uh, functions on the character variety, now I just want to put DRAM everywhere. So I want DRAM functions on the character variety. So if you like, I'll just write it as DRAM cohomology of loc g sigma. So I take the character stack, um, the Betty space of local systems, and I want to take its DRAM functions rather than its functions. Now, this doesn't yet make any sense because the field theory is not, doesn't make it to dimension two. So we're going to try to make sense of this. Um, now, the idea is that this theory doesn't make it to dimension two, but th that's because there's some parameters in the theory that you need to fix. And we're going to uh, try to get back to it on, in Friday and uh, make it more precise, the parameters in which to fix. This is what we were calling super selection sectors last time. They're kind of pieces of this theory that do make it further. And that's, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to fix some parameters, so at least the naive version of the parameters, which is going to fix the action, fix everywhere some the natural parameters in representation theory, which is the action of the center of the enveloping algebra of UG, which is functions on the dual carton mod W. So we're going to work sort of one infinitesimal character at a time. So what does that mean? Um, well, let me give you some examples of, of G Duram categories. What, what are examples of strong G categories? There's two classes of examples uh, in nature. And those two classes of examples are, you know, so here's the examples, examples of strong G categories of B of G modules. Well, the most obvious thing to write is if I look at D modules on a space X, where X is a G space, then this automatically carries uh, action of D of G. So this is the same thing. This is just a categorified version of saying if I look at functions on a space with the G action, it has an action of the group algebra of G, or as it carries a representation of G. So you literally write down the same map. You have G cross X, write down the action map, and then and then you just write down this diagram, you get out of that a module structure for D modules on X. So that's, that's an obvious example. The other kind of example is looking at representations of the Lie algebra. Um, if I look at representation of the Lie algebra, this also carries a strong action of the group of, of G. Uh, and the action is coming here just from the, the adjoint action. G is acting on the Lie algebra by conjugation, and that m moves modules around. Um, and so what we, so this is a place where we see some natural parameters. This module is a place where we see there's action of the center of the enveloping algebra. And so we can think of fixing it. So let's, uh, let's fix it. So let's let, let's call it P0. This is for, supposed to suggest unipotent principle series. Um, unipotent uh, principle series. Um, we take it to, to be, UG modules on which we fix the action of the, of the enveloping algebra. Uh, enveloping algebra, act, the center is acting through the augmentation. And, uh, but Balenson Bernstein theorem tells me that, well, Balenson Bernstein really tells me that these two classes of examples are not really different. They're just two aspects of the same story. Here it's the category of D modules on the flag variety. Um, so that's my unipotent principle series, this conversion of functions on the flag variety. Um, so let's look at this module. Uh, I, I don't need to, zero is not so crucial here. We can put some more general lambda in here, and we'll get instead of G mod B, I can look at G mod N uh, monodromic D modules on G mod N for some monodromicity lambda. Um, and then I'll get UG mod lambda for lambda nice. But let's fix zero for simplicity. Um, so we can try to understand the part of the character theory that's generated by this module. Just like when we studied finite group, we looked at functions on G mod B. That gives a part of the theory, and we can ask if this part of the theory is any better. Um, so let's think of not all G categories, but of G categories that appear in the unipotent principle series. Um, 
so, so, we, we can, so what am I going to do? I'm going to think of this in the way we had before. We're going to think of this P0 as a boundary condition for my field theory. So this is going to be my P0. It's a boundary condition. It's, a, it's an ob element of the two-category texture point. So I can look at its endomorphisms. And um, if I look at endomorphisms as a D of G module of P0, there's a fact. This is the same as D modules on G mod B mod B with convolution. Uh, so this is the, the Hecke category. This is the Hecke category of cartan lustig theory. Um, so the, the intertwining. So this is something that acts in an obvious way on D modules on G mod B. Acts by convolution on the, on the right here. Uh, and that's exactly the endomorphisms of this, of this module. And so we can uh, try to build a new field theory, the sector of the original theory, where we just only look at modules for this, for the Hecke category. In other words, G categories that appear in the principal, um, in the uniform principal series. And yeah, yeah, so this is endomorphisms of P0. Look at the endomorphism of P0 as a G category, and we can uh, make a field theory out of that. So, take the, so I want to take this, this Hecke category instead of D of G. I really would like to do D of G, but this is a piece of it. And the dream that we'll try to make more precise is that if I vary lambda, I vary the monodromicity, I get the whole theory. As I look at all, D of, D la, all of these H lambdas for various lambdas, I get the whole theory. But for now, I just want to... Just talk about H0. And so the, 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 the theorem um, with David Nadler is that, uh, well, the H0 is too dualizable. So, so H0 does better. These Hecke categories are better than the whole theory. It does make it all the way up to dimension two. You wouldn't really, we don't expect anything to ever make it to dimension three, unless it's built out of finite groups, which this isn't. So um, this is much better than you. This is better than before, and it's about as good as you can hope. Um, and now, what does it attach? So now I can ask, what, it what does this theory attach to the circle? So I'm looking at the field theory. So I'm looking, what is the integral over S1 of this monoidal category? And, uh, and the claim is, well, of course, that's, again, basically by definition, the Hochschild homology of this monoidal category. And the claim is that this is exactly what appeared in, this is already appeared in David's talk yesterday. This is uh, unipotent character sheaves. So this is, this is, looks at, these are certain D modules on G mod G uh, with nilpotent singular support and an extra parameter. This, there's a parameter which is a central character, which is zero. So what this means is if you look at D modules on G mod G, you have uh, the center of UG acts as differential operators, which are uh, G by invariant. So you look at, um, you can look at G by invariant differential operator, and you want to fix the action of the G by invariant differential operators on a D module here. Um, so we fix the action. So the central character is saying that we fix that the center of the enveloping algebra acts the same way it does as on the Harishandra system. Harishandra system, uh, let's see, Harishandra sub zero, which is the Eigen system. I look at, um, I could just write down z dot f equals, uh, the, I guess, the augmentation of z applied to f. I look at Eigen functions of the center of the enveloping algebra, thought of as by invariant differential operators. So this is a particular system of differential equations. This is the one that Harishandra wrote to describe characters of representations. So I'm writing eigenfunctions of the in bind variant different. This is just means the augmentation. So it, the center acts as it does on the trivial representation. Um, and so we so we look. So what we get as the Hochschild homology is exactly uh, the unipotent character sheaves. Uh, and again, you can put in lambda everywhere if you don't get other other parameters. Um, so this is what you attach um, to the circle. So in particular, you uh, and um, and just maybe again to connect to David's talk, the Hochschild homology is n has a universal property. It's something that ca that's a target of a universal trace. Um, so, given uh, any algebra, we always have a universal trace map to Hochschild homology of A. Um, that's that's a universal trace map. Uh, and so here we need to what is the map? from uh, H0 to character sheaves. 
And it's given exactly by the Hora cycle correspondence. You look at D modules on G adjoint quotient B, look at D modules on G mod G, and you uh, pull back and, and push forward. So that's, that's the, the trace map identifying. So in the, the image here is, is exactly is, is character sheaves inside of here. OK, so, so this is um, what well, this is now, but maybe something a little more concrete out of that. In particular, what is good about this trace map is you can ask for what is the trace of the unit. Uh, so the trace of the unit in the Hecke category, which just means the character. So we, we can ask, what are the characters? Um, so here we're looking at the circle. And I'm really drawing the same diagram I wrote last time. I'm asking, what is the character of um, H as an H module, which maybe you didn't care about, but it's the same as the character of P0, uh, the character of the principal uh, uniform principle series as a G category. And what you get is just following this diagram to the unit, you just get the, um, you get the Springer sheaf, which is the push forward of, you just apply this to the unit here, to the diagonal, ask the diagonal, you get instead of all G mod B, you get B mod B, B mod B, which is the Grotendieck Springer resolution mapping to G mod G, and you push forward uh, the constant sheaf. So this is the, the same kind of character formula we saw last time for finite groups. You get the Grotendieck Springer sheaf as the character of the uniform principle series. And since it's on the board, this is HC0. This is the Harishandra system by the theorem of Hara Kashiwara. Um, so the, the Harishandra system is appearing as the character, or the Springer sheaf is appearing as the character of the uniform principle series representation. Okay. Um, so more generally, what this, this picture is telling you is that characters of G categories, at least G categories in a uniform principle series, these are exactly loosely character sheets. Loosely character sheets are characters of G categories. OK. So now um, I'd like to return to this theory uh, next time and try to make a precise sense in which you, well, talk about what it attaches to surfaces and what happens when you um, try to integrate this over, over, the, over the center. But uh, for now, I wanted to pass, move on to another example, class of examples. Any questions so far? Okay. So I want to discuss uh, one more class of examples of topological field theory. Now I want to make it up to four dimensions. So we had uh, two dimensions. We had uh, two Young Mills and the B model in three dimensions. We had rosansky witten theory, and we have this character theory. So this is QC of, of x with tensor product. This is D modules on a group with convolution. And now we want to go up to, to four dimensions. And there's two examples, which I'll call the uh, kind of Betty geometric Langlands, uh, the Betty geometric Langlands theory, and the Betty quantum, the quantum version of geometric Langlands. Um, so these are going to be examples of 4D field theories. So what, what is, the, and what is the, the idea? I'm going to, to define a 4D field theory. I'm going to start again with, well, I need to construct a three category. Uh, the easiest three category I can write for is to write, uh, well, I'm going to write uh, Braided, so to write a three category, I'm going to need to write a braided monoidal category, but the, I already have something in mind, which is I take rep G, or if you like, QC of, of BG. That's a symmetric monoidal, symmetric monoidal, um, that's a symmetric monoidal category, which I can think of, can think of as a three category if I, if I want to. Uh, I can think of it as anything. Um, and so I'm going to define uh, field theory. And uh, there's, uh, there's a fact that's due to uh, Jacob Lurie and Kevin Walker, uh, which says that this rep G is, uh, is in fact, 3 plus 1 dualizable. 
So we're going to make a four-dimensional field theory. We're going to get up to vector spaces for three manifolds. We're not going to get numbers for four manifolds. Um, now, what do we get for free? Uh, for free, and that's the only part I'm really going to talk about, is what you get in dimension 0, 1, and 2. Um, so in dimension 0, 1, and 2, you get something for free. So to a point, I just attach rep g, or if you want to think of it, I can look at rep g mod mod. That's my, my three category. Um, or just think of it as rep g. To a circle, what am I going to do? It's the same, it's the same construction. I'm going to look at quasi-coherent sheaves on the loop space of bg, which is g mod g. Well, that's what I had in rosansky witten theory. I had sheaves on g mod g. But now I'm going to think about that as a monoidal category with tensor product. So if you like, I look at it, if I attach a two category to the circle, it's going to be modules for this. OK, so it's the same object as before, but now boosted up one level, boosted up one category level. And to a surface, um, I'm going to attach, again, by the same kind of calculations we had before, you'll attach quasi-coherent sheaves on loc g of sigma. OK, so and as, again, everyone who's been to this talks this week knows this is the wrong answer a little bit. This is too small. What we really want is, is intco, intco of loc g of sigma, or maybe intco nilpotent. We can, we, we'll talk later about where the nilpotent comes in. But this is, uh, so this is a kind of a small version. Just like us with rosansky witten theory, our first guess is a little too small. This is a kind of a, a little too small uh, an object, too. But that's the thing that's easy to construct by, as an extended field theory. Um, so to connect to David's talk yesterday, we really want a, a bigger version of this. Um, but for now, we'll just talk about, about this theory. So that's what it attaches. And it's harder to calculate what it attaches to three manifolds because it's not given formally just by, by this kind of tensor product. Um, OK, so why is this thing called Betty geometric Langlands? So I'd like to try to convince you that, you that this is very similar to various features. This is, of, of course, the spectral side of the geometric language correspondence. Well, of course, we, we see on the level of a surface, we see quasi-coherent sheaves on, um, on local systems, which is very close to the spectral side of the, of the geometric language conjecture. Uh, if you know the work of Frankel and Gatesbury on local geometric language conjectures, that's very close to what we have here. Um, they consider sheaves of categories over the space of connections, uh, of G connections. And, and by the way, G here, you could probably put a check over everything. There's a big. Um, so it's space of G connections on the puncture disk, while these are, are G local systems on the circle. So this is kind of the Betty analog of this. They, look, they looked at sheaves of categories over the space. We're looking at sheaves of categories over G mod G. So that's the kind of Betty analog. Um, and you can say a lot of other things. So of course, if you look at these spaces, the space of, on a Riemann surface, if you have a Riemann surface, if, it's, if x is algebraic curve, algebraic curve, and I'm going to use x for the algebraic curve and sigma for the underlying topological, the, the Betty space of x, topological surface. We, 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 if you look at the space of connections on x versus, so I'm using this for the Duram space versus the Betty space, um, these two spaces are analytically equivalent, they're algebraically, they're algebraically different. So the categories of quasi-coherent sheaves or incoherent sheaves are, are different on these two spaces, but they share various pieces in common. For example, the points here are the same. OK, that's not so analytically isomorphic. So you know, the points are literally the same. But a little better is true is that formal neighborhoods of points are the same. So if I look at uh, zero-dimensional if you look, for example, at zero-dimensional sheaves, sheaves with zero-dimensional supports, then they're literally the same in both, in both, of, these, in both of these worlds. So they, these worlds share, and there's other kind of pieces of these worlds that are in common, but kind of in the large, these kind of are integrating the same small things in a, in a different way. Um, OK, so that's in some sense the idea for this Betty geometric language is that a lot of the things you care about most in geometric language correspondence is really about zero-dimensional sheaves. For example, Hecke eigen sheaves, automorphic sheaves on the other side, are the things that are supposed to correspond to points. So the, the Hecke eigen sheaves will be objects that live in this category just as well. Um, but they're put together in a different way. 
Okay. So this is, uh, we'll I'll say more about some features of geometric Lang as you can see in here. But, um, but before that, I'd like to say something about the, the, the quantum version um, to see a few other features of the geometric Langens correspondence appearing. So what is the quantum version? So um, one way to say it is that if I look at this space of flat connections on X or the space of local systems on X, uh, these are not just analytically uh, isomorphic, they're an analytically symplectomorphic. Both of these have natural symplectic structures, uh, which are identified, um, which given basically by the cup product on H1 Durham, which is the same as H1 Betty with coefficients in a given local system. And we can uh, think about quantizing, so we can try to quantize this category, this, this symplectic structure, which means deform the category of sheaves. So we're going to quantize uh, this category instead. So here, when you quantize uh, space of connection, the quasi-coherent sheaves on connections, on X, you get something that is very familiar in geometric language correspondence. You get D modules on bund G of X that are twisted. They're twisted by some something, let me, what do I call it? Let's call it the, I don't know, the determinant bundle to some power one over K. So you look at twisted D modules for very, very large twisting. There's a, this canonical determinant bundle on bun G of X. Look at a very, very high power of it. Look at twisted D modules on this space, and they converge as the twisting gets high to quasi-coherent sheaves on this space of flat connections. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we'd like to similarly have a quantization here. Um, and so let's say something about what that quantization is. And again, that quantization can be done on the level of the whole field theory, not just on the level of a first surface. Uh, something that's going to be the analog of twisted D modules, which starts to look a little more like geometric Langens correspondence. Once you work in the world of tw twisted D modules, you can't really tell if you're on G or G check side. The two sides start to look the same. So um, that's why I'm, why I'm happy st just using Gs instead of G checks. Um, so let me, let me try to define a, a, a quantization of the right-hand side in the language of field theory. So what do I need to do this? Well, I, I want to give another class. There's another class of uh, field theory. So we said, that, we said that before that our commutative ring, given our commutative ring, you could define our tensor M, where M could be any, any simplicial set or any homotopy type. Uh, and this, was going, this is how we defined these field theories. We, took, we, in, we defined a field theory integrating m over r. Now, there's another class of things you can also do the same thing with, which is uh, en algebra. So now I'm going to take r to be an en algebra. So what is an en algebra? It's, you can think of it in a few ways. We said it's an, I can think about this as an n category. Uh, with one object, one morphism, one two morphism, one three morphism, blah, blah, blah. So it's a, it's a very degenerate, it's kind of a maximally degenerate n category. Or I can think about this as um, an algebra over the little n disks operad. So it's an algebra which carries a multiplication um, by uh, little n disks. So it ha has a structure of multiplication that every time I see a uh, collection of elements labeled by, by disks inside of a big disk that gives me a product operation on this algebra. Or I can think about this as algebras in algebras in algebras in blah, blah, blah in DG vector spaces. So these are things that have n compatible multiplications. That's, and you should think of this as the different axes going on here. So it's something that has a bunch of compatible multiplication. So this is a class of n categories that includes what we had before. So this is really the E infinity. Makes sense for any n. But we have here a, a sim class. And now we can't define, it does not sense, make sense to define m, r tensor m for any simplicial set. But it does make sense, does make sense with the same formula, essentially, but now for m, any, I really need a, a framed n manifold. So I'm, I've been very sloppy about keeping track of a framings versus orientations in my theory, and I continue to do so. Please ask me if you want more. But uh, so any n manifold, really, I need, I need a framed, or else I need something called an n disk algebra. 
Uh, and so I, I, I still make sense of that. And, what, and what's the picture? The picture is sort of the same thing. I, I, I now, for example, if I have an E2 algebra, I want to define this picture. But now I, just like before, we had this commutative ring R, and we started doing all these tensor products. Now, I can't do this just abstractly out in space, as I can with a commutative ring. But an E2 algebra, this is something that has multiplications defined by the plane. So I can think of attacking this R from these sides and attacking these R's from the middle. Uh, so you can write down a co-limit just like before uh, that defines this tensor product. But now it's given in terms of uh, I need to think of having a framed n-manifold, and I need to think of my dots as being little disks inside of this framed n-manifold. And now I'm allowing them to collide, and I impose tensor product relations when they collide. So I don't want to give the precise definition, but it's basically the same kind of idea. Uh, and, and it goes by the name of uh, factorization homology. So this is a topological version of the definition of Balenson and Drinfeld uh, that you can read about in papers of John Francis and Dennis uh, and, and Jacob and Kevin Costello. And, uh, yeah, but the, it, this is a version of the balance and Drinfeld definition in the topological setting. So, um, so it still makes sense to do the same operation, except that I can't do it for any n manifold for any simplicial set. I can just do it for n manifolds. And so this is the, and so the claim is that again, um, every E n algebra is again n dualizable, or I should use my terminology. It's n plus one dualizable. I can get a field theory that gives me vector spaces for n manifolds from an EN algebra, by, by, and this time by an explicit formula. This notation of an integral is a lot more explicit in this case than, it, than, in, than in general. So this is, again, I'll call this the integral over m of r. But here it's really given by a formula rather than just by definition of cobordism hypothesis. OK. Um, Yeah, so I, I really mean I can take, so the way I'm going to, yeah, that's good. Uh, what do I mean by, by this n manifold? I can think of any manifold of dimension up to n, but I'm thinking of them as always being framed. So somehow there, there's a secret, the secret here in this, I think, in the Cabordas hypothesis is never to think, when you're doing an n-dimensional field theory, you never think of things of lower dimension than n, you just think of things that are less and less compact. So I, 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 when, I th when I think about a, about a point, I'm not really thinking, about, you know, when I say a point with an n-dimensional framing, I'm not really thinking about a point, I'm thinking about a little disk. And when you say one manifold with an n-dimensional framing, I'm thinking of a little tubular neighborhood of a one manifold. So you, you, you're just, re when you're doing this Cabordas hypothesis, in some sense, you're always dealing with n-manifolds. This integration procedure is just extending to things that are less and less compact or more and more global. Um, so, uh, so, and the factorization homology formalism takes that into account. It's sort of, it's always defined just as an integration on n manifolds, but the n manifold doesn't need to be compact. Um, and so you get, so for example, the integral over the two disk of your algebra is the algebra itself. That's almost the. An, right. Exactly. So then it satisfies some, 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 some uh, Meyer Vietoris laws, it satisfies sort of some gluing laws. And it's completely determined by the integral of d2 of r is r and, and some natural meyer Vietoris formula, which is basically what the Cobordism hypothesis says anyway. But um, OK, so, um, so you know, what is, again, if I have r as an en algebra, when I'm thinking about it as an, what does it mean to think about this as an n category? As an n category, it's the same formula we had before. I'm going to take r mod mod mod. Now you say, wait, I used before that I had a commutative ring in order to do this operation. So what's going on here? If R is an EN algebra, if I look at modules for this, this drops down. This becomes an EN minus 1 category. So modules for an EN algebra lose a level. So for example, if N equals 1, an E1 algebra just means associative. And modules for an associative algebra are just a category. They don't have. Um, well, they're really a pointed category. They have the, the object, the, mod, the, the algebra itself is a natural object in there. But I lose one. And so maybe one way to picture it is if I think of an EN algebra, here's an E2 algebra. This is something that's kind of living in the plane. If I think about things, about boundary conditions, I can still think about colliding boundary conditions. So boundary conditions are things that live along the boundary, still have a room for an associative multiplication, but they don't have room for an uh, for a E2 multiplication. And boundaries of boundaries don't have room for anything. 
So that's somehow the idea. And EN, if you look at R mod, you can still take R mod. That's still an EN minus 1 category. So you could look at modules over that. That's an EN minus 2, 2 category. And you build your way all the way up to the top, so you get an n category. So this is what it means to think of an EN algebra as an n category. You really have an n category, but it has a distinguished object, which is R itself. So if you'd like, it's an E naught n category. It has a, it's a, has a marked object. OK. Um, all right, so, so let me, uh, so this is, um, this is uh, one kind of general construction of field theories, and we can do with it the same thing we were doing before. Well, before what we said is that we, rather than taking kind of affine things, rather, we can take kind of one affine thing. So rather than taking literally a, an E2, an EN algebra, I can look at an EN category. So what is, and the point is that there's an example that we all love, which is of, of an E2 category. So what, so, I'm going to take as my, I'm going to look at an E2 category, well, rather than E2 algebra. An E2 category is the same thing as a braided tensor category. This is exactly the pictorial realization of what it means to have a braided tensor category, to realize things in terms of points, configurations of points, or little disks inside of a big disk. So if you have a, a braided, well, I have a favorite example, which is, rep Q of G. This is the representations of the quantum group. So this is the, the representations of the quantum group associated to, to G. So this is representations of UQ, of finite dimensional UQ of G modules, where I fix the center so I get the right group here. So there's a natural braided tensor category that I want to apply all of this to. Um, and again, the, the kind of fact of, of Lurian Walker says that rep Q of G, so again, this is an E2 category, so you should count 2 and 1. So this is a really a kind of a 3 category. And so it has a chance to make a, a four-dimensional field theory, and the claim is that this is 3 plus 1 dualizable. So it defines a four-dimensional field theory that, as, as usual, doesn't make it all the way to numbers. Uh, and this is what I want to call the, the, Betty, um, the Betty geometric Langlands, quantum Betty geometric Langlands there. Um, OK, so, so this is what my field theory is. And so you can ask, for example, um, and so this, is, this defines a field theory, which, which is this, I don't know, it's too many letters, the Betty quantum geometric Langlands theory. Um, OK, so now, um, so what, what things do we, what kind of features can you say about this theory? Well, for example, you can look at what are its boundary conditions. So to give a boundary condition, so that's the kind of things you attach to a point. These are the kind of things you attach to the theory on a point. Uh, well, how can you write a boundary condition? Well, uh, boundary conditions, you would need um, kind of two categories inside of this three category are module categories over this thing. And what, over the corresponding, well, let me just spell it out. You just get algebras, you get monoidal category, how do I say it? Algebras uh, C tensor over rep QG. So if I give you a braided tensor category, it makes sense to look at for a monoidal category, which, which is this algebra over this. So this maps to the center of this. So it's a monoidal category with a map from this to the center of that. So, OK, so that's, that's a kind of thing you can have. So you can have, where do such things come? For, for example, if you look at rep Q of, of Borel, that's an example of a, of a boundary condition in this theory. Um, and um, in fact, you can make rep Q of a Borel. Well, a rep Q of a Borel is better than a boundary condition. It's a domain wall. Rep Q of the Borel is a bimodule category. It's an algebra object in bimodules. This is, an, in fact, an algebra object in bimodules, in bimodule categories for representations of, of G and of the torus. So it's really something that's defining a domain wall between the T theory and the G theory. So this is, a, this is exactly a, this lifts to a domain wall. And this domain wall has a name. This is what we call, this would be geometric Eisenstein series. Of, of course, you can do this for other, other parabolics. So this theory has things like geometric Eisenstein series. It has functoriality for parabolic induction. These are natural domain walls in, in the theory. 
Um, and you can see lots of your other favorite structures appearing. But let me maybe get back to what I uh, promised was about the quantization. You can ask what happens when you integrate this over a surface. Um, And, and I should point out, that just as in a ring and gate square, you find out that if you're careful, if you really want to integrate, this, this boundary condition is not going to be too dualizable. This domain wall is not going to be too dualizable. On a surface, you know you don't, Eisenstein series don't want to live in the quasi-coherent world. They want to live in the incoherent world. So it's a well-defined boundary condition, but it doesn't make it up to surfaces unless you, you kind of decomplete your theory. But let, let's ignore this kind of subtlety. Um, so before, we had the space of connections, G connections on a Riemann surface, space of G local system on the topological type, and we quantized that. We looked at D modules on bun G uh, of X at some level. You can similarly quantize this guy, and the quantization here, that's exactly what our, that's the point of all this construction. The quantization here is just what our field theory attaches to the surface. It's integral over the surface of rep Q of G. So this is a category that's a deformation of the quasi-coherent sheaves on the character variety. So that's this quantization of the character variety that we're identifying. And uh, this is kind of the Betty analog of twisted D modules on bun G. So um, what, how can you, what, other, what features makes it analogous? So for example, one of the imp most important things we know about this is that there's a, a, a balance and Bernstein localization here. You can construct twisted D modules here. Uh, you can construct them by taking uh, integrable representations. Um, how did I how did I want to write it? Um, look at you could look at re uh, integrable representations of the affine Katsumudi algebra at level. I guess I called it one over k. Look at integrable representations at that same level, and there's a natural localization functor. These these representations give rise to D modules on this space. Um, it's kind of a Balance and Bernstein construction. Uh, so you can ask, for example, what is the analog of this construction? But we have the Kajdan Lustig equivalence that tells us that the same category of integral representations appears in here. It is just rep Q of G. And so, and there's a natural functor here. Yeah. Arbitrary. It can be a root of unity. Yeah, I mean, th yeah this, this construction is sort of Q is arbitrary. Um, yeah, so you have a, and now what is this construction? This is something we've already mentioned. This is the analog for an associative algebra. Remember, we had a map, a trace map from the associative algebra to its Hochschild homology, which was A, t the integral over the circle of A. And similarly, when you have a canonical map from any EN algebra to the integral over the, um, over any manifold of, uh, of R, if I choose a point, I need to, so what is this map? This, uh, maybe this, it's not canonical until I've chosen a point, just as this is. This map doesn't, it depends on the choice of a point. I need to tell you where I'm, I'm looking at bundles and I'm gonna trivialize those bundles near a point and then use that to construct representations. The same thing here, um, I can just think of including a little disk into my manifold, including a disk at a point, and, there's, and this thing was defined as some big co-limit of a bunch of products of R's. So there's literally inclusion of one factor into that co-limit. This thing was a huge... Ten it's about taking for the outer... Uh, yeah, that's right. But, but yeah, that's right. Uh, but it's very concrete in this way. This is just some huge tensor product of copies of R, some big uh, co-limit. Co yeah, and, and this is just the inclusion of one factor. Just map that guy in. And it's the same as, as this trace map. So there's a canonical map giving a point. And, and so we have, so this is the same kind of, we have the same kind of balance and Bernstein localization type picture. Um, so it has some of the same structures. And in fact, this structure is very, very strong. Um, this, this structure is, is uh, this map is, is monadic. You can describe this category purely in terms of stuff here. So that's what the theory of skein algebras does. You can write down what this category is very explicitly as some pictures some dots labeled by representations and some loops satisfying some relations. That's really just describing this category in terms of a, 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 a monad, in terms of this. Um, so we can make that even more concrete by, um, so 
or you can ask, what is that map? At q equals 1, that map is something very obvious, which is just saying that you know, at q equals 1, you know that loc g of sigma has a map to bg, which is restriction. If I give you a point x sitting inside of sigma, you can take a local system and restrict it to a point. And this map is just pullback of quasi-coherent sheaves for, for this. So there you get a map from rep g to qc of loc g sigma. It's just pullback. Now this map is an affine map. So this, this is an affine variety over bg. And so you can describe anything you want in terms of here, in terms of here. In fact, this makes uh, QC of loc G is not just a functor. This is, in fact, is a module category for rep G. This is a monoidal map. You can tensor, tensor sheaves here by sheaves here. So this is a module category. And so you can describe QC of loc G sigma. It's saying it's an affine, you can describe QC of loc G sigma is the same as mod. You can describe it as modules for some object in rep G. There you can write down an algebra object in representations of the group and write sheaves on here. It, in other words, it just functions on this thing, thought of as a representation. Uh, you can write this as modules for, for rep G. And so you can write down a, an explicit algebra object in representation of G. That's, and uh, the same thing works in the quantum setting, except in the quantum setting, you, you still have this functor. You only have this module category structure if, you, um, if you're a punctured surface. You need to have a puncture you, in order to really get the structure, not just of a functor, but a module category. I need to give you a, 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 a punctured surface with a marked point on the boundary. So I need a kind of enough room to act. I need enough space. Maybe I can think of extending this to a little collar. I, I need enough room for my bubbles to kind of float around to make this into a module category. But in any case, if I take, if sigma, if I look at sigma minus x, um, if sigma is a punctured surface, then you can really write this integral over sigma of loc g, uh, uh, sorry, integral of sigma of rep q of g, this quantization of the character variety is equivalent to modules over explicit algebra in representations of the quantum group. You can write this down very explicitly. This is done in a paper with uh, Adrian Brochier. So all of this it comes from a paper with Adrian, uh, David Jordan. Um, so you can write down a very explicit algebra, and you get algebras that you kind of know and love if you study quantum groups. For example, if you take a punctured torus, you get the, exactly the algebra A is what's known as the algebra of quantum differential operators on G, the, the algebra of differential operators on the quantum group. So you can write down explicitly what all these algebras are and describe the, these categories. So that's sort of one pleasant feature of this, of this Betty story is everything is very concrete. Um, OK. Um, when Q is 1, it's literally, you know, so local systems on a, on a surface are given by, you know, I have a bunch of copies of G, one for each loop. Uh, you know, present the fundamental group. You have a bunch of products of Gs. Then you have some equation that they all have to satisfy. You know, some product of commutators equals 1, mod G. So if you look at it over BG, or if you like, if you trivialize at a point, it's an affine variety. It's a product of, it's a one equation in a bunch of copies of G. So it's an affine variety. Saying, I'm just saying it abstractly, but it's an affine variety over BG. So that means it's modules over a ring. That ring is just a ring of global functions. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can write it down. I mean, it's just a bunch of tensor products of the functions on, on the group modulo with one, one equation. I mean, it's something very, very I mean, it's just the ring of functions on the f character variety when you trivialize at a point. So it's, some, so it's something very explicit. These guys are also very explicit. You can write, they're defined in a completely kind of tautological way. In particular, they carry actions of the map. And one, one thing I should say is this algebra carries an action of the mapping class group of your punctured surface. It's defined in a completely field theoretic way, um, in a kind of tautological way, but, but you can write it down also very explicitly. Questions? Well, th I mean, so this deformation is, uh, has been written down by various people in various languages. This is, the, you know, you can quantize characters. So these character varieties are f explicit varieties. You can write down, uh, I'll get, I won't get all the name, but there's uh, Falk and Rosley and Senesh and 
many others probably. Uh, so you can write down these kind of moduli algebras, or you, given a ribbon graph, you can write down some various algebras that are quantization. So you can quantize this character, this uh, explicit, this Goldman, Tia Bot symplectic structure. You can quantize it using representation of quantum groups. And that's what this category is. It's modules for those quantized algebras. The, the point, the new point maybe is that you're right, getting it sort of out of, it's just a part of a field theory. Kind of getting some abstract structure on it that maybe was harder to see, but that's, that's sort of the well-known well quantization. Okay, other questions? Um, okay, so now maybe one more um, thing in this direction. You can ask, um, while, you're, while you're there, you can ask what about the Langlands conjecture? And so David, um, David Nadler said in his talk yesterday, gave a, gave a, a version of a Betty quantum geometric, a Betty geometric Langlands. So a conjecture at Q equals one. Uh, that you can also make a conjecture when Q is not equal to one, it has a very different flavor. So one side of David's conjecture was kind of a constructible story about, about Bungie and something that wasn't yet clear how to make into a full field theory. Uh, the kapustin witten story ex tells you that you should expect um, a, an equivalent so that, that Langlands duality, that geometric Langlands is, uh, is supposed to be an equivalent of field theory is supposed to be some equivalent of field theories. Let me call it Z, Q, G is equivalent to Z, Q, check, G, check. So here, Z, Q, G is, is what I'm using for this notation where I integrate over various things, representations of the quantum group. That's this field theory. Um, so you can, you can make a conjecture. Now, the nice thing about uh, Q not equals to one is that both sides look the same, just like as in usual quantum geometric lines. Both sides look like twisted D modules with opposite twistings. And here I'll get the formula probably wrong, but it's something that, you know, what is, what is the relation with the K? You know, the relation, I guess I should have said in the cartesian lustig story, the relation with K is something like E to the pi I, and maybe there's some factor if you're not simply laced, and there's K plus a dual coxeter number. So it's some complicated expression, and then, and what we're supposed to do in, in language is take k goes to something like 1 over k, but again, maybe with a, with a shift. So it's k goes to minus 1 over k. We can do integral shifts if we want. Um, and this is, uh, so we're supposed to do level k for g and level k check uh, for g check. Um, and the quantum geometric language is uh, saying the same kind of thing for this theory with q and q check. So you can write down what q check is in terms of the formula. If you just first write the formula, it looks a little unpleasant because you're saying, you know, Q goes to something like E to the minus one over log Q or something, and you write that down and you think this sounds awful. Uh, but then, then you realize what this is saying. Let's, let's sort of ignore the difference between G and G check. Let's, you know, maybe we're GLN or something. Um, this conjecture is saying, the, the conjecture really says, says that our, this field theory, ZQ of G is, um, is, some, is something, is really the Q expansion of some kind of a modular expression, of a modular, of a modular field theory. In other words, that the field theory is not really depending on Q. You're writing down a field theory in terms of a parameter Q, but you're really doing kind of, you're writing it down in some sense, something where Q is really representing the Tate curve. You're really trying to write down a field theory that depends on an elliptic curve, and you're writing it kind of formally in some parameter, so it looks kind of not maybe so pleasant, but this is exactly what happens when you try to write down a modular form. So really, it's saying that ZQ of G is really Z of some elliptic curve, G. And it should extend to a theory that depends on an elliptic curve. Of course, I'm ignoring the difference between G and G dual, so you need some level structure or something. But, but that's what the, the quantum geometric language says, and this is what the physics is somehow predicting, is the way this theory comes in, in life is somehow labeled by an elliptic curve. There's really some geometr geometric object in the physics which is an elliptic curve, and that's for an elliptic curve we're supposed to get a field theory. Um, now, of course, you'll know, as, as with the rankin gates square story, this is not literally going to be true the way I wrote it now. You need to re replace Q codes by int codes in various places. I mean, we have some completed version of what the true theory is. Uh, but you can still, still imagine that once you put the right, com you know, uncompleted theory that this Thing. And, and, and one thing I was surprised to find out is that this is actually, there's lots of experimental data, uh, experimental evidence for this. There's something uh, that's called Fadev's uh, modular double. Uh, there's something called Fadev's modular double of a quantum group, and there's a whole literature 
these papers by uh, Ponso and Teschner and uh, Igor Frankel and uh, uh, Falk and Gontrov, and a lot of all following up on this notion of modular double, which is basically relating quantizations of character varieties for Q and G and Q check and G check. So there's kind of a lot of evidence in sort of a different s part, so to speak, of, of geometric representation theory. Um, so, okay. Um, when did, what, what the time, I have no idea what, when I started or what the, hmm? Um, no, so maybe I'll say uh, what I'd like to do next time is uh, introduce sort of, um, you know, you can complain a lot of things about the language, you know, I've, I've said, okay, we have Eisenstein series, but what about uh, Hecke operators? What about singular supports? What about uh, ramification data? There's a lot of kind of features, bells and whistles that go in the language correspondence. And those b bells and whistles all come completely naturally from the point of view of physics. They're, the, they're studying defects of various dimension in the field theory. So what I'd like to do next time is explain what defects of various dimensions in the field theory are. And if time permitting, I'd like to talk about, uh, go back to the, the story about the character theory and how the character theory, and we try to get the character theory as a kind of dimensional reduction of geometric language and sort of see where, where its role in life is. Okay, thank you. I think there's one in the back. <laughs> I was wondering if you could go into any more detail about that affine Bellens and Bernstein result you were talking about for the localization functor. Y yeah, to, to express the uh, twisted oh, I, I mean, modules on. I can write down. Uh, well, I wasn't stating any result. I think the results. I don't know. Maybe Nick. Nick. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, the results that are analogs of the kind of integration statement that I want, but at least what the functor is, uh, if I look at uh, bungee of a Riemann surface, and I have, um, I can look at a, a version decorated uh, at a point. Uh, so I look at, look at bungee x, I can look at bungee x with x, which is, uh, so it's G bundles uh, plus an infinite level structure, so a formal, trivialization uh, near x. So this is a torsor for the positive part of the, of the loop group. Um, and, uh, and the nice feature about this torsor is on the total space, we have an action of the loop algebra, not just of the uh, positive half, but the whole loop algebra acts on the total space. Um, moreover, we have over here this determinant line bundle. Uh, well, the determinant line bundle lives, lives here. I can pull it back. Now the determinant line bundle and the action of the loop algebra lifts if I take the appropriate central extension. If I take the determinant bundle to k, this lifts to a level k action of the of the Katsumudi central extension. Um, so and so the idea is that if I give you a, a representation of the Lie algebra, it maps to twisted differential operators on here, twisted by this representation. So the, Lie, the enveloping algebra at level k maps to differential operators here. Given a module for this, I can tensor it with differential operators. So I, if I give you a module m, I can take, I can take, um, I get a d module here, which is just tensor with differential operators, twisted m over the enveloping algebra. And then because it was a G of O integrable representation, it descends. This is a G of O integrable thing. So this, uh, this is G of O integrable representation uh, meant that this thing has a descent structure. It gives you a twisted d module on bungee of x. So this is the, the kind of balance and Drinfeld construction, how you relate representations of Katsumudi algebras to D modules on Bungie. Um, and um, yeah, and, and I believe there are statements, I don't know, Nick will say what they're, but it's some statement that the, some version of chiral homology of this, this category is giving you something that's something. Okay, Nick agrees. Uh, so so, th so there's an analog of the result on the other side that the, the, the category was, um, so I think it's harder to state on, on, on the quantum group side, literally the chiral homology, the, the factorization homology of rep Q of G was this quantization of a character variety, and there's a similar picture. This category of twisted D modules on bungee of X is closely related to chiral homology of representations of the Katsumudi algebra. So this is kind of the, the quantum, quantum group version of, of that story. It has a kind of different flavor, but... 
Uh, and this, these ideas are all come from uh, some Gate Square and Lurie manuscripts. But, um, <coughs> 